that. So thanks for taking the time to uh, talk about your new book, uh, The Confident Mind. By the way, I uh, love the book. Uh, they sent me a, uh, an a uncorrected proof, but it seemed fairly correct to me. So, but I enjoyed it. And uh, I would, you know, uh, Dr. Zinzer, I would love to know what got you interested in high performance? Well, I always wanted to be a uh, successful athlete as a kid. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to play professional football as a kid. Um, I was not blessed with um, enough of the genes for that. Um, but I kept competing, um, wrestling, lacrosse, et cetera, et cetera. And it was during my junior high school years that I became very aware of the importance of you know, what I will simply call at the moment intangibles in terms of athletic success. I went to a very small private boys school, which interestingly enough had a powerhouse soccer team. Year after year, this team was good. And they beat teams with, you know, five times our enrollment and hence five times the talent potential. And interestingly enough, at the school, this particular team was the only powerhouse team year after year after year. And even more interestingly, you could take half the soccer team, put them on the basketball court, and they were downright lousy. But it was something about that soccer team something about that the shared values and commitment that they had and this is largely due to a legendary coach by the name of miller Bellari. he was able to create amongst that team an expectation that if they were somewhat diligent they would be really good and the guys in that program bought into that sort of collective self-fulfilling prophecy and it worked the whole school bought into it the whole state bought into it. So, you know, when the Pingree School soccer team showed up on the bus, um, other teams were, you know, a little bit scared because they knew they were up against the powerhouse. Um, and even more curiously, I didn't even play for this team, but I saw this at work at the school. And I took some steps to see if we could create a similar constructive team mythology for the wrestling team that I was on because I thought we had some, you know, it's a pretty talented guys, you know, and if we get a few years of experience under our belt, we can, you know, we can make something good happen here. And sitting at the lunchroom one day, I think I was in the ninth grade, I was telling some guys, hey, you know, we got, we got talent, we get seasoned, we're going to be damn good. And a classmate of mine sitting on the opposite end of the table said, look, Nate, shut up. You're never going to be any good. He said, and I quote, guys at this school don't wrestle well. We're good in soccer. Sometimes we're good in swimming. Sometimes we're good in tennis. But we're not good at wrestling and we never will be. And that just hit me really hard. How do you, where did you get this crystal ball? Now, on the face of it, the fellow was right. Because at the time, the wrestling team was a doormat. And he was convinced that such situation would continue indefinitely. And it was just an example of this shared collective self-fulfilling prophecy that was working against the wrestling team at the time and very much for the soccer team at the time. And I'm proud to say that in my junior year, the wrestling team had its first winning season in decades. And we had a winning season my senior year and we haven't exactly been a doormat ever since. Uh, so I'm quite proud of that. But that, Dan, is the long story about how it is that I got into the whole psychology of high performance. Yeah, well, I love the story. And I'm, I'm just thinking about this shift that happens in people's minds about the way they think about themselves or the way they think about possibilities. And, you know, how do you get people, you got the classmate on the other end of the table who's like, we're losers and that's what we're going to be. How do you get people to change their thinking about themselves? Slowly, carefully, often agonizingly. Um, 
in a way, that's a lot of what the book is about. Offering ideas about the choices that you have in terms of how you think about yourself as a performer, how you think about the performance endeavor that you're engaged in, whether it's a sport, whether it's a musical instrument, whether it's um, a, your career. How do you think about that experience? And how do you think about all the things that happen to you within that experience? It's, it's the idea of being of opening yourself up to the choices that you have in terms of how you can think and demonstrating to people that the choices you make really have a huge influence on your emotional state, which in terms has a huge influence on your physical state, muscle tension, blood flow, hormone production. And because we are human beings embodied, we live in our bodies, those changes in our physical state have huge implications for our actual execution. Whether we're talking about how you hit the tennis ball, how you hit the golf ball, how you deliver the lecture, how you conduct the meeting, how you uh, execute in the operating room, in the courtroom, you name it. How we think affects how we feel, affects how our bodies are, affects how our execution is, and then we tend to reflect upon and think more about our execution. So it's very much cyclical, and we have to make sure that that is a constructive cycle rather than a cycle that just keeps you mired in mediocrity. Yes, uh, there's that, that uh, graphic in the book that goes through that. And also, uh, I, early on in the book, you, you reference Viktor Frankl and uh, yes. you know, his, his work, which is you know, it's so unassuming. His book is short, it's unassuming, but it's like, bam, you, know, you, yeah. you got to get a grip on your thinking. About what, that, is you know, about that is pretty powerful stuff. He, the last human freedom, as Frankl put it, is the ability to choose your attitude, your thought process, regardless of circumstance. And nudging people to make a constructive choice, regardless of how much positive feedback they're getting in their actual work or actual life, is paramount. You have to make that choice. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen, you're making it every day, whether you realize it or not. So you might as well get aware of that. And you might as well start making choices that put you in a position to be more certain about yourself. Yeah. Wow. So before we, uh, I want to get your definition of confidence and, you know, some of the things in the book that uh, are really about building and protecting confidence. But before we do, uh, for almost everybody, there are moments in their life where somebody said something to them that shifted their thinking. When you were a kid, somebody said something and it, it made you think differently about yourself, about life, or about what was possible or the future or something. And I wonder if you could just you know let your mind drift back a bit to an experience that you had when somebody said something to you that created the shift in the way you thought about yourself or something in, in life um i can think of a couple of those mm -hmm. moments um at that same small private boys school that i attended there was an assistant principal i think in the middle school um he was not the most pleasant individual uh, that I've ever come across, um, but he did look me in the eye once and he said to me, you have more desire for sports than any kid I've ever seen. And that was pretty meaningful to me when I, I was 13 or 14 or whatever, you know, he was, a, he was a, an authority figure saying that I had the right kind of hunger. Um, and I interpret that to mean that as long as I stayed hungry and showed the desire and kept working hard, darn it, I was going to be successful. Um, so that was one moment that was, you know. Before you go to the next one, what interests me about that is that he saw something that was already there, not something that wasn't there. I think sometimes we, we spend a lot of time focusing on what people should be that they aren't. But he saw something that was there, and I'm fascinated by that. Yeah. I, I mean, I was a pretty hardworking kid, you know. I was the first guy 
to show up for practice and I was, you know, really focused in each and every, you know, drill and calisthenic activity. Um, and he picked up on that. He said, yeah, you're, you're the hungriest kid I've seen. That's and awesome. I really, and I really took, I really took that as encouragement. Yes, that's awesome. That is awesome. You said there was a couple that came to mind. Why not? Why not the other one? Um, well, the other one came several years later when I was um, I was just finishing my undergraduate degree, and I had been practicing very traditional old school Japanese karate for about three four years. Um, and I finally had the opportunity to test for my first level black belt. And the man administering the test was the head instructor of the organization, a Japanese gentleman by the name of Tsutomo Oshima. Oshima was the first Japanese karate expert to teach in the United States. He was the founder of the oldest organization in the United States. And he passed my, my my test passed his um criteria for success and he said nate you have talent mm. he just put it pretty plainly like that yes. and i say okay yeah i have talent i have something you know now talent in and of itself doesn't mean a heck of a lot unless you work to uh express it manifest it develop it but i that was great corroboration um from a very, very well-respected senior individual. Um, yes. And I took that and ran with it, and I've been running with that one ever since. Wow. Uh, congratulations, by the way. You know, what's interesting to me is I think we need to appreciate if we have some sort of respect or if we have a position or if we have authority that people, the words that you say have weight is yeah. that ever the truth? Um, all you leadership freaks out there listening to this podcast, um, please understand there is there is almost nothing that comes out of your mouth. There's almost nothing that even comes out of your um, nonverbal body language that doesn't have meaning and impact. Everything you say, everything you do, every little aspect of the way you are, communicates uh tons yeah, and you yeah, better be powerful. careful about how you're doing it you've got to make sure well, that you're communicating the right kinds of message and i think you know that's it, it, just uh before we uh, focus in on what confidence is and, and that type of thing you know i i think because when we show up in an environment it, our, it's our natural tendency to see what's wrong and what isn't working and you know there's a tendency to focus on those things, then that affects our language. That really does take a mental shift to say, what's working here? What's right? And you know, I work with leaders. I know you work with athletes and, and coaches. And, and I think sometimes they love to just hear me say, you know what, your company's really fortunate to have you. you you're working hard, you wanna do well. And uh, the first person I ever coached, I sat down across at a coffee shop. I had a uh, we had coffee, and I said, "You know why we're here?" And she said, "Because um, I'm screwing up, and they want you know they want me to improve." And I said, "No, you're here because you're worth it." And I honestly believe that that was the tipping point for her. We had other conversations, but we didn't need to, right? Mm -hmm. Because it was that it was that. Uh, the, belief i think so what is go ahead if you wanted to jump in on that well your comment to her as a, an advisor of some um value and importance carried tremendous weight for her she could have discounted that and said well that's nice you know dan it's nice of you to say but I really don't feel that. You know, she might not have said that out loud, but she might have felt it on the inside. The important thing is that she took that comment from you mm. and internalized it and began to operate from that. Um, as important as the comment was, what's just as important is what she did with it. Mm. Um, and this really gets to so much of the importance of 
how to build and how to maintain and how to defend confidence, it ain't so much what happens to you. It's how you think about what happens to you. It's your decision yeah. to interpret, I use the term filter a lot, to interpret perhaps might be the best word in this context, to interpret what is going on in and around you in a way that is constructive. And that is precisely the lesson um, from Viktor Frankl um, in the Man's Search for Meaning book. It's, it's not your circumstance. It is your perception and your mm. responses to your circumstance. I'm yeah, glad wow. that you gave that, you know, that professional the right kind of comment, but I'm doubly glad that she took it in the right way and ran with yes. it. Yes, that's awesome. That is incredible. So um, make sure, let's make sure we're talking about the same thing. When you use the word confidence, what, what is it that you mean? I define the term in a very functional, practical way. Um, confidence is usually thought of as a sort of abstract, intangible quality. Um, I try to put it in more functional terms. I, my operating definition is the sense of certainty that you have about a given ability or a set of abilities, which allows you to execute those abilities more or less unconsciously. The certainty you have that allows you to tie your shoes very quickly, very expertly, without walking yourself through each step of each eyelet and each part of the knot, it's an incredibly complicated activity. Lots of muscles, lots of nerves, lots of joints operating in perfect harmony. Once upon a time, you had to be very careful and analytical about it. But at some point you said, okay, I got this. I don't have to think about it anymore. And it's bringing that same degree of unconscious certainty, that same degree of informed instinctiveness to the other really important parts of our lives. Kicking that potential game-winning field goal, making that key presentation, landing that deal, having that conversation with your, um, with your performance team, with your supervisors, with your subordinates, having that same degree of certainty in those moments, that's what confidence is. Yes. All right, so the obvious question is, what are your suggestions to getting to this point of unconscious certainty, confidence? Well, <laughs> that's, that's the book, obviously. <laughs> yeah, that's the book, um, or, at least, or at least the first four or five chapters. Um, that certainty that you have is a function of the various decisions and interpretations you have made of your previous experience, you know? You have enough experience tying your shoes, you figure, okay, I got this. I don't have to think about it anymore. I'm unconscious. You did the same thing learning to ride a bike. You did the same thing learning to drive a car. You did the same thing learning to do all kinds of things in your life. You worked at it and then you made decisions about it. So what I'm constantly urging people to do is to make the right interpretations, the right filtering of the memories of their past, of the stories and statements they have of themselves right now in the present, and of the pictures and video clips that their imagination produces about their possible futures. Okay, let's, let's be careful. Let's be selective. Let's not just respond passively to the ups and downs and the good and the bad. Let's pour all of those mental experiences, memories, stories, visions into what I refer to as a mental filter. And let's make sure that we're looking at the ones that create energy and optimism and enthusiasm. You know what's... It, it... I, you know, you have a loud inner critic. A lot of people have, a, you know. Oh, yeah. And, and the bad experiences, uh, they stick with us longer than the good experiences so frequently, right? What's the baddest, stronger than good research that, you know, you remember more frequently with greater detail, um, you know, and has a bigger impression on you. So how, how, do, how does one uh, kind of overcome the natural negative inclination that we have for self-judgment and not in a... In, 
for self-criticizing, self-beating down? How does one overcome this? Um, one thought at a time. Let's become more aware of that inner critic, that screaming ninny, as one of my colleagues likes to put it. We need to become more aware of when does that tend to show up? And then once I'm more sensitive to it, once I'm more aware of it, I can decide to talk back to that voice. The same way you might talk back to an obnoxious sibling when they disagree about the dinner choice or the movie choice or whatever. I want this. No, we're going to do this. You have to be aware when those voices pop up, acknowledge that, oh, okay, I'm not thinking effectively right now. I'm getting in my own head. I'm beating myself up unnecessarily. Envision a stop sign so that you cut that train of thought off and then deliberately insert a statement or three that I think you need to have in your back pocket about how you want to be. Okay, you know, oh, I can't seem to hit a serve today to save my life. Stop, breathe. Let's just get this next one. Let's just get this next one. Hang in there. You can make this. That kind of very simple motivational self-talk can produce tremendous changes. You just got to be patient with them and work them and work them and work them. And they will change your mood, which will change your body, which will change your execution. Yes. There's this uh, self, self cheering on or self. Uh, there's a video on YouTube of a young person taking a ski jump off of the never been I, off the hut. I know. I know exactly the clip you're referring to. And, yeah. and this poor kid is, is, is really pretty hesitant up there because never done it before. Um, right. And eventually the kid lets himself go yeah. and he flies off the ski jump and he yeah. lands and there's a whole bunch of his pals down there at the sort of landing strip. And he says, well, it was really easy once I let myself do it. And he's almost ecstatic about the experience. Yes. yes. I yes. love the that confidence. Clip. Yeah, I do too. I, the confidence uh, that uh, that is, well, 60 seems like nothing now is, you know, in other words, it was, I think it was a 40 meter jump and, you know, it's like, or whatever it was, but it's like, there's the sense of confidence that comes from the first win or the first victory, which is in the book. I was fascinated by this. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah. Again, just going to back to that wonderful clip, that kid had to win a victory over the voice of worry and doubt and fear. Once that victory was won, the actual physical victory of landing safely off the jump was possible. Um, I use the term first victory um, in reference to a piece of the classic work on military strategy, The Art of War, written by the Chinese strategist Sun Tzu in the fifth century BC. And the, the, the phrase translated from the, the Chinese reads, victorious warriors win first and then go into battle while losing warriors go into battle and then hope to win. Yeah. Something about the mindset that you have before things start is key. So I make constant reference to winning that first victory winning that conversation between the voice of self-doubt, winning that conversation or the um, contest between a recent memory of success versus a recent memory of a setback or a disappointment or a mistake. Um, that's the inner game of life as we know it today. Yes. I get a little tired of... Uh... Uh, say it so in order to make it so, even if it is so, lie to yourself. Oh, you're great. You're great. You're great. I'm not hearing that in your ideas of winning the battle in the head. Right? Yeah, you can't be too self-delusional. Okay? You got to be <laughs> a little, a little bit, a little bit self-delusional. Yeah. Um, 
I've had some people balk at the idea of using, you know, affirmational statements. You know, um, I'm the fastest. Uh, I'm the fastest 200 meter runner on the team, um, or uh, I am the number one violinist at the uh, Cleveland Philharmonic. That may be too much of a stretch for them to wholeheartedly mm -hmm. endorse, but a statement like my first stride out of the blocks is explosive and creates separation. Maybe that's something that they can lap, grab, you know, grab onto. Or, you know, the instrument feels like just an extension of my body. Mm. Maybe the violinist can get behind that. And if you keep your mind on those things, if that's a repetition, 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 well, then you allow yourself to be more comfortable in the races and in the musical performance. And in doing so, you might just become the fastest darn person on the team. Yes. You might, yes. You might just become the best violinist uh, in the orchestra because you are allowing what you've got to come out rather than polluting what you've got with a whole lot of fear, doubt, worry. Oh gosh, how do I handle this passage? Oh gosh, right. she, I, I'm, I'm in the lane next to the uh, repeating, you know, league champion. Um, right. Keeping, keeping your mind on yourself. I've got this. I do this well. This is my opportunity. That state of mind really facilitates the expression of your acquired training. Yes. I have a million questions for you. We just got a couple of minutes, so that's driving me crazy here. Fire, but, uh, fire away, Dan. I love this. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm curious about confidence and arrogance uh, and humility. You know, I'm just curious about that. I don't blame you. I think the world is somewhat curious about that. Unfortunately, I think the world is somewhat confused about it. One of the great misconceptions about confidence is that Confidence is the same as outspoken, chest beating, calling attention to oneself, arrogance. And as a result, some people really shy away from looking for the best in themselves for fear that they will turn into that arrogant so-and-so that they knew 10, 15, 20 years ago, and they'll be daggone if they're going to be perceived in that light. And what I have to keep telling them is that for every outspoken, loud, chest-beating, confident individual that so much of our print and broadcast media loves to highlight, there are at least as many, probably twice as many more quietly confident individuals who feel the same way about themselves as the loud, outspoken folks but they're just not naturally inclined to talk about themselves very much. They have it on the inside, but it just would never occur to them to broadcast it. So please, ladies and gentlemen out there, if, if you happen to be a quiet, somewhat modest individual, great. Developing bulletproof confidence is not going to make you any less likable. You, you want to have that bulletproof confidence so that you can perform at your max, but you also want to have a certain air of modesty, of courtesy, if you want to have any friends, um, you can have them both. That's the good news. Yes, that is the good news. Now we're at the end of our time. If you have a moment for a, a final, again, I'm, I'm just having to cut through all the stuff that I would love to talk to you about and say, how did writing this book uh, change you? That's a great question. And the answer is in many, many ways. Um, this book, the work I did with it, articulating the points chapter by chapter, paragraph by paragraph, and I am a very laborious, careful writer. Um, doing so really made clear to me how valuable a lot of this advice is. I think I had discounted my own agency and I had discounted some of the value of a lot of these insights that I've been working on for three decades. So putting it together like this over the last five years that I've been working on this really solidified the importance of it. And in so doing, I have very much changed the way 
that I lead a client through the process of identifying what it is that they want and how they're going to get there. Fantastic. Well, the book is uh, The Confident Mind. It's uh, fantastic. Love the book. And I, I just wish you well with it. I hope it gets a very broad reading because uh, I, it's going to help a lot of people. So thanks so much, Dr. Zinzer. Appreciate your time today. And thank you so much. And my best regards, best wishes for everybody out there in your listenership. Yeah, thank you.